Another episode of Titans Tears. If you're new to the series, we're grouping everyone on the Titans roster that plays meaningful snaps into different tiers. We're looking at the entire season holistically, but I do weight the more recent games more heavily. For the first time this season, there's only one player in the disaster tier, and that's going to be Andre Dillard. There isn't really a whole lot to say about him at this point. He loses in pretty much every way. He'll lose to speed, he'll lose to power. Sometimes he won't know the snap count and he just won't get off the line of scrimmage. The hope was that he'd be a stopgap option at left tackle, at least be a replacement level starter somewhere in the David Questenberry, Dennis Kelly tier, but he's been unplayable. Definitely going to get cut this offseason. Only 7 mil in dead cap though, so it's not a disaster from a cap perspective. Chigakonkwa is moving down one tier. He just can't catch anything. He still has some nice ability as a route runner, at least for a tight end, but he's turning into a player that Will Levis needs to stop looking towards because he's just not going to catch the ball. And I think a lot of his snaps and targets need to start going to Josh Wiley, who's been a much better player in every phase. Dylan Radins is going to stay in the bad tier. He's been an upgrade to Andre Dillard for sure, but there are just so many limitations to his game that get magnified at left tackle. In week nine, he had a lot of one-on-one -on -one matchups with TJ Watt, and if you ever watch TJ Watt, he basically has two ways of winning. He's either going to win with speed around the edge or an inside counter, and he was pretty much selling out to stop the speed rush. He won all of those reps, but anytime TJ Watt tried to spin inside or counter to the inside, he would lose. And then week 10, he started off pretty solid, but as the game progressed, he started to lose more and more. He ended up allowing seven pressures. I would guess most of those came in the fourth quarter, especially on the last two drives. He was just getting worked. So if you're deciding between Raidens and Dillard at left tackle, I would definitely go Raidens, but I feel pretty confident that he isn't the long-term solution. Christian Fulton is going to move up a tier. He had three straight really good games against Baltimore, Atlanta, and Pittsburgh. He would be in the mediocre tier, but he had a pretty rough showing against Tampa Bay. He got beat on a quick slant to Mike Evans, sort of a rub route type of thing. And then there was an inbreaker in the red zone, shook him at the top of the route, and then he over pursued trying to tackle. Mike Evans got a touchdown. For anyone that's still invested in like the results of the Titans season, I think he'll be solid going forward, but probably not a player that they're prioritizing re-signing. And then Eric Guerra also is going to be in the bad tier. I never really got the hype from the preseason. He had a few nice plays on screen passes and underneath stuff, but whenever he would have to stick with someone at the route break, there's just a lot of stiffness for someone that's pretty undersized, and he was getting exploited in the Steelers game especially. Moving on to the media mediocre tier. We're going to start with Amani Hooker, who's had a pretty underwhelming season. Early in the year, he was getting beat pretty often, but he was also making a handful of plays to kind of offset that. The playmaking has pretty much stopped, and he's still getting beat just as often. I know you shouldn't really expect safeties to be able to keep up with elite receivers and man coverage, but whenever he gets put in that situation, it's just an automatic 15 yards. And he also gave up that touchdown on the screen pass to Rashad White. Jack Gibbons is also going to be in the mediocre tier. He'll make some plays when he's unblocked, but if he's ever in a situation where the D-line's losing and he has to shed blocks. He's just very limited. And he's a player that 90% of the time is going to be at an athletic disadvantage with whoever he's matched up with. Doesn't have great speed to protect the edge. I'm not sure why Monty Rice isn't starting over him. He played great and limited snaps against the Bucks. Maybe the Titans coaches are uh, looking at his Twitter likes. Chris Hubbard is what I think a lot of people, including myself and the Titans coaching staff, expected Andre Dillard to be. He's going to have three or four bad losses per game, but he'll be solid outside of that. Kind of opposite of Dylan Radins. I thought he started started off the Bucks game playing as bad as I've ever seen him, but he eventually settled in and he wasn't really the cause of the pressure down the stretch. I've got Harold Landry moving up a tier. He has slowly but steadily started to regain some of that athleticism. I will say his sack against Tampa Bay where it looked like he just outran Luke Hideki, he got an assist from Jeffrey Simmons pulling his jersey, which has been kind of the one consistent way the Titans have been able to get pressure this year, but he's at least impacting a few plays every game. And then Elijah Molden had basically the game ceiling penalty against Tampa Bay, and then there was one one rep where he just got trucked by Luke Kadecki. Other than that, I didn't think his week 10 performance was that bad. I saw he had like a 33 PFF grade. I think they're punishing him for the uh, penalty pretty hard. But yeah, he's a high effort player with good coverage instincts, just kind of limited athletically. All right, onto the average tier. Peter Skaronski is going to move down two. I had a really high rating on him because a lot of it was just based off of his week one performance. I think if you just took the top 80% of his plays, he's having a pretty solid rookie season. He's got a lot of highlight run blocks for the most part, he's been pretty solid in pass pro. And I think looking to the future, he does project as a high quality left guard. But every game since he came back from the appendix, he just had four or five disastrous reps. I don't know how much to put on the appendix surgery. I actually didn't know before this year that that was something that could linger for a long time. But there have been a handful of plays where he just gets overpowered. He lost to Keanu Benton in week nine on the club swim. He got handled on a run play early in the Bucks game and turned what should have been a solid gain into a two or three yard loss. As far as moving him to tackle, 
I'm not saying anything new here. A lot of people have said this line, but I think you've got to let these players fail at tackle before you move them to guard. If you've got a player like Skaronski or Elijah Vera Tucker that you draft early, it's so much easier for them to return the value on that draft pick if they're just an average to slightly above average tackle than being a good or really good guard. Like Skaronski would have to be a Zach Martin caliber guard for him to exceed the value of just an average starting caliber tackle. So that's where I would have played him to start out. I'm not exactly sure how much upside there is in moving him to tackle now. And Mike Vrabel seems to have no interest in doing that. Chris Moore's moving down a tier. He's been fine. Unsurprisingly, he isn't keeping up that insane efficiency that he was early in the season. And then Arden Key's also moving down a spot. He was completely shut down by Tristan Wirfs really until the last drive. I still think he's a good player, but for him to be that impactful, he needs a good pass rush around him. And then Nick Westbrook Akine has been good whenever he gets targeted, but a lot of the plays that he doesn't get targeted, it's because he's not open. The last couple years watching Titans games, trying to evaluate the quarterbacks, there's so many plays where it's just nobody's open. Nick Westbrook is usually one of those players is getting locked up by man coverage. And then Aziz Alshair is also going to be in the average tier. He's had two incredible plays in back-to-back -back weeks as the pole runner down the middle. He had that one play in Pittsburgh, third and long. They were in Tampa too. He gets a pass breakup. And then Roger McCurry's interception from week 10. I actually thought that was a more impressive play on Aziz Alshair's part. He ran with the slot for 40 yards. McCurry was able to slide in and get the pick. And even though he's faster than Jack Gibbons, there are some similar issues defending the run. He just isn't great shedding blocks. And he's a high energy, high effort player, but that screen touchdown to Rashad White, he had coverage responsibility, probably could have impacted the play, but he just kind of hovered downfield. So given what David Long got in free agency and the fact that he's been a top 10 linebacker this year, I think that was definitely a mistake not to re-sign him. We're going to start off tier three with Kyle Phillips. Uh, these are not ordered horizontally. I just kind of realized that might be misleading, but Phillips had a rough game as a route runner against Baltimore, I thought. Made a few plays against Atlanta, and then the last two weeks, he's been probably their best receiver, at least on a per snap basis. He's still only playing about 20 snaps per game, but I would be in favor of him taking some of Chris Moore and NWI snaps. The Titans just don't have anyone else on their roster that's as quick and explosive out of their breaks. He did have the drop against Tampa Bay on such a small sample size that is enough to move him down a tier, and this doesn't factor in special teams at all, but they should never have him return a punt again. Danico Autry is more of a splash player at this point than a consistent winner like he was last year. He still makes three or four high impact plays every game. He got a chase down sack against Tampa Bay and then he beat Tristan Wirfs on a cross chop, but the efficiency has really declined and he's a part of the Titans pass rush just being inconsistent game to game. I'm moving Aaron Brewer up a tier. He's been such a consistently good run blocker. There still are limitations in pass pro, but centers just don't face that many vulnerable situations and he's winning enough of his one-on-one -on -one reps to where I would call him a net positive. If they do keep him at center long term, he's got to figure out how to snap the ball more consistently. I'm sure everyone remembers the Malik Willis snap, but it seems like there's one bad snap every two weeks probably. So he's a player that I would expect them to bring back, but that's something he's got to fix. And then we're going to round out this tier with Will Levis. Not a whole lot to evaluate from week 10. He had five drops and he was getting hit constantly, but he also had a handful of dropped interceptions. A few of those were dropped by the Titans receivers first, but there were a handful of bad decisions. Most of his interceptions and turnover worthy plays have come in game winning drive situations where he's trying to press and he has to be aggressive, but I still think he's shown enough that he should be the Titans quarterback one heading into next year. Really no question about that. And in the first round of this draft, I think you've got to get him an offensive tackle. I'd even consider doubling up at the position in the third round. Roger McCreary's moving down one tier. He had his first bad game against Tampa Bay. He was playing mostly on the outside with Sean Murphy bunting out, but overall it was a pretty rough performance. He gave up a deep ball to Trey Palmer that he didn't end up holding on to, and then a couple plays later, they went right back to him and he lost to Mike Evans on a post. So rough game, but overall I'm optimistic about his development. Josh Wiley's also going to be in the good tier. It's a small sample size of snaps, but he's been really efficient when he's gotten his opportunities. He did have a drop in week 10, but overall I just think he brings so much more to the table than Chigakonkwo right now, especially when you factor in what he can do as a blocker. DeAndre Hopkins is going to stay put in the good tier. Go balls to D-Hop are basically Will Levis's version of a check down. Out of receivers with at least 35 targets, he leads the NFL in average depth of target at 16 yards, and that can result in some big plays, but it's also kind of a boom bust way of moving the ball down the field. Against a matchup like Joey Porter Jr., who I think is already one of the best press corners in the league, he gets jammed up at the line of scrimmage pretty easily, but he's still a crafty route runner and really good hands, so like what he's been able to do. Jeffrey Simmons has been good, but I think he's been a slight disappointment. His effectiveness as a pass rusher is just really inconsistent week to week. There will be games like New Orleans, LA, Atlanta,
Atlanta where he's just taken over unblockable but there will also be games where he just kind of disappears and doesn't make much of an impact the Steelers game was kind of an outlier they were getting rid of the ball so quickly but he's only had four pressures in the last two weeks and I've said this in all of these videos but I think they need a little bit more from him as a run defender I'm moving Derrick Henry up a tier not really because of anything he did I just had him too low in the previous video I think he's about as good as he was the last two years he's just really struggling to break big runs there have been a lot of plays that could have been the classic Derrick Henry 50 yard touchdown but he's been getting taken down by shoestring tackles at the second level in week 10 he averaged 2.2 yards per carry but none of that was his fault he was getting hit immediately when he got the ball and as for the Derrick Henry Ty J Spears debate I really have no opinion I think it's just a dumb conversation overall they essentially play different positions Ty J Spears is playing the Jeremy McNichols Dontrell Hilliard role he's going to be in there on third down obvious passing situations so the difference in their usage is entirely dependent on game flow and if they're winning or losing and then we're rounding out this tier with Tier Tart say that five times fast this list is based off of film not vibes I know there's a lot of issues between him and the coaching staff they don't seem that impressed with his availability and he's subtweeting the coaching staff like a wide receiver but when he's on the field he's a high impact run defender he barely gets any pass rushing opportunities but he has been really efficient he had a great push pull move to get a sack in week 10 and yeah really any run defense struggles outside of the first drive of the game against Cincinnati have not been on tier tart and then alone in the great tier is Ty J Spears he ranks second to Devon a chain in yards after contact per attempt with how incompetent the run blocking has been I think they need to start getting him the ball out in open space a lot more he's almost a guarantee to make the first guy miss and maybe they re-sign Derrick Henry next year maybe they bring someone else to be the quote-unquote lead back but I would be perfectly fine with him getting the bulk of the carries next season thanks for watching if you enjoy the video make sure to like and subscribe also let me know in the comments any NFL players or teams that you'd like me to cover